although she showed no sign of it, Margaret was impressed. Not just with what he said, but with the man himself. Something about him struck a chord in her. He was, there was no other word for it, beautiful. Surprised by the direction her thoughts were heading, she shook them away. She had to make a decision. She decided against the recommendation in the file summary and decided instead to follow her gut instinct. Taking her time, she closed the file and folded her hands on top of it. She looked at Robert and then at Romeo, who seemed to be trying to sink into the floor. She looked at her colleague and then flicked her gaze back to Robert. I have decided to give you and your nephew the benefit of the doubt, Mr McGregor. Ernest bolted upright in his seat, blinking, but Margaret raised her hand. He could rant later. She nodded at Robert and her voice crisp and clear. I am going to put this boy in your care for six months, Mr McGregor. We will meet on the 15th of every month to see how things are going. After that, we can decide how things will go on. He nodded. Thank you. I'll see you again soon. She stood up, gathering her papers. Romeo can't go with you immediately, I'm afraid. There are a few things we have to work out with the police and his youth worker, but then he's all yours. It took hours to fill in all the forms and run through the endless list of rules and regulations. Then they had to wait for the paperwork to be processed and wait and wait some more. By the end it was too late for them to drive home, so they called a taxi to the motel where Robert had stayed for the past two days. Dinner was KFC delivered to the room, and half an hour later, Romeo was fast asleep. 6.30 in the morning, Romeo stumbled out of the motel room yawning. Robert was leaning against a truck in the frosty car park. Come on, boy, he said. Get your gears in the back of the truck. We have a way to go before we get home. Couple of stops for gas, a feed, and a piss, and we should be okay. Get there about three, maybe four this afternoon? Romeo stared at the mud-encrusted, dilapidated truck and then looked at his uncle. His brows slid up. Don't judge by first impressions, boy, Robert scowled. If I did that, the first time I saw you, I'd have thrown you back. Romeo opened the cab. Whoa! Apart from the muddy rubber mats on the floor, the interior was immaculate. Thick black sheepskin covered the seats and spread across the dashboard was a control panel of flashing digital lights and an impressive silver face stereo. At the end of the gear stick was a small silver skull. Told ya, Robert said. Chuck your gears in the back and get in. Romeo's possessions consisted of a meagre collection of clothes given to him by welfare people. Stuffed into two plastic grocery bags, he shoved under the tarp. Romeo climbed in, watching his uncle out of the corner of his eye. He wasn't scared, just weary, of everyone and everything. Too many bashes had flown his way and he didn't want to risk a backhander from this guy. It would knock his head off. His gut ached, twisted and tied up by his inability to control anything in his life. Every choice taken away. First by his fucked up parents, then the law, and now his uncle. A man he didn't even know. Freedom was bullshit. No one he knew was free. Booze, pee, dope, stupidity, kids or bills. Everybody had something pinning them down. He wrapped his arms around himself, tensing his stomach muscles to try and relieve the boiling of his insides. But it wasn't working. He moved a little, hoping it would ease, but it just got worse. To take his mind off, he stared out the window. He'd never been out of Auckland before. As they flew down the motorway, leaving first the city and then the suburbs, where the scenery melted into pastoral farmland, his nerves began to unfurl like a burgeoning kōru. The thud of salmonella dub filled the cab and warmth gushed out of the heater, seeping all the way through him to his chilled bones. Even though his stomach still hurt, he began to relax. He stretched his legs and soon his chin was resting on his chest. He crossed his arms let the sheepskin beckon his body in and drifted off to sleep. They stopped for something to eat at Topol. 
Robert bought them a feed and they sat on the sandy shore of a wide stretch of bouncing blue water. Romeo ate in silence. He watched Robert kick off his boots and socks and dangle his feet in a sandy basin-like depression on the shore that filled with steaming water. A few moments later, he did the same. He'd never felt anything like the effervescent softness that tickled his feet. It's a hot spring, Robert explained. The water is boiling when it comes out of the ground, but mixes with the lake water, so it's just warm. Romeo nodded. A few minutes later, others, mostly kids, sat around the pool and plunged in their feet. Romeo jerked away from them and pulled his shoes back on. He tried to make himself invisible, huddling behind Robert. Why don't we eat in the truck? Robert asked quietly. He pulled out his feet and stood up. The kids stared at Robert as he unfolded himself. Their mouths dropped open. Whoa, you're a giant, one young girl said. She was about.